morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, thanks to uh, Paul for the introduction. And uh, how about a quick hand for the SCTE? And, uh, and then putting together, once again, a, a nice event for all of us to, uh, to join and, and learn a little bit, maybe. Uh, and I'm sure everyone's interested to get out, uh, out there as soon as possible. So thanks very much to the team of the SCTE. Uh, as you may have noticed um, from my title and background, um, I come from a, uh, or educational background, I come from, a, from, from the business world, and I'm not an engineer uh, by trade. So you may be wondering, what's a, a sales guy MBA doing standing up here talking about uh, the implications of, or the CNR implications of higher modulations that come along with DOCSIS 3.1? And you'd probably be right to be asking yourselves that question. Uh, however, uh, what I can say is I've spent, uh, as Paul mentioned, over 10 years focused on particularly head and RF management. And that's with tier one cable operators around, uh, around Europe and, uh, and Asia previously as well. So while I may not be able to get into the nitty, nitty gritty physics behind the calculations and the concepts that we'll be going into in this uh, presentation, I cer certainly have seen them uh, being implemented and uh, in practical use and they've been shown to be uh, accurate and useful. So with that caveat firmly in place, um, let's dive right into the, uh, into the subject matter. Um, so my intention today is to talk particularly about head-end RF management. That's the splitting and combining of broadcast and narrowcast uh, signals on the RF level in a head-end. So we'll start with a, a quick simplified architecture just to identify what specific part of the network we're talking about. Uh, and then go into some of the uh, implications of CCAP, uh, which is replacing CMTSs and edge qualms, as well as DOCSIS 3.1, the uh, extended bandwidth and higher qualm modulations that come along with that, and what, how that impacts our planning for head-end RF management. From there, we'll go to uh, some other signal level considerations and general application notes that come from uh, DOCSIS 3.1 implementations and trials that I've seen so far in, uh, in Europe and other projects we've been involved in around the world. Uh, ATX Networks ex itself is focused particularly on head-end RF management. It's our core business. So let's start off with the part of the network that, uh, that I'm referring to here. This is obviously simplified. Uh, what you see is four uh, downstream transmitters with your narrowcast devices here on the left combined with the broadcast feed. So this is a simplified RF combining architecture which takes the, uh, the outputs from the narrowcast devices. In the CCAP case, for example, we've gone with a one-to-one -one port ratio to the uh, RF combiner before the transmitter. And these are placeholders. It could be VOD. It could be a legacy, um, a legacy CMTS. It could be whatever narrowcast devices you're inserting. And that will be different depending on the operator. Um, so keep in mind that this could be any other narrowcast device that you could conceivably want to uh, uh, insert to any, any transmitter. So what does CCAP mean? What does CCAP mean for RF management? Um, I think everyone has seen uh, c the uptake of CCAP over the last few years has been uh, impressive. It's been incredible. I mean, the, the ARC 6000, for example, has got been going in everywhere. Uh, and it seems, though today, uh, CCAP is being used primarily as a CMTS in most networks. The functionality, in fact, the entire idea of CCAP by definition is to converge the multiple narrowcast services onto a single device. So you no longer have a CMTS plus edge qualms plus sweep, sweep plus everything. Everything theoretically in the future is going to come from one, uh, one device. So the ultimate logical extension of that is really one day there won't be a need for RF management in narrowcast. There's going to be a direct connection between the CCAP, the narrowcast device, and the optical transmitter. But that day is not going to be today. There's, there's going to be a transition period between when full functionality of CCAP is being used and uh, how it's being used currently. So what we've seen being, being done and what we uh, recommend, um, particularly as a manufacturer of RF management equipment, uh, is keeping a level of RF management before the transmitter so that you have the opportunity to insert. Although theoretically that level won't be needed in the future, you do achieve some additional flexibility by having that there and having that plan to be there from the, from the first place. That allows you to reuse, for example, legacy equipment. So if you have any equipment that's being uh, used concurrently to new CCAP platforms, that can be inserted. 
Uh, one other uh, application I've seen regularly is to allow for a seamless switchover of services. So there's all, often concurrently DOCSIS 2, DOCSIS 3, DOCSIS 3.1 being put down the same transmitter because at the end customer the modems haven't all been upgraded yet. And it supports a pay-as-you-grow philosophy. If you have an RF level in your network, you, can, you don't have to start building from a one-to-one -one port ratio to the beginning. You can, uh, grow, or sorry, you can shrink that ratio as, uh, as segmentation continues. So what I'm trying to say with this uh, slide is we recognize that RF management will eventually not be needed, but there is a relatively long time between now and that day. And for a relative, relatively small cost of around 80 bucks for a combiner, uh, compared to the overall cost of a, a link from a transmitter down to an end customer, it's worth keeping that flexibility. What other impact is there for, for CCAP on RF management? In a one gigahertz environment without going to DOCSIS 3.1 as CCAP is being implemented today, it's still 256 QAM, so the CNR requirements haven't changed. There was some confusion about an isolation spec that comes along with CCAP. Uh, where it, um, it states that there needs to be an isolation of 65 to 70 dB. Um, we went back to check with the guys that wrote that specification, J.P. Fiorini and Ron Ranach, and they confirmed that that refers specifically to the output ports on the CCAP. So we'll, we'll go into detail about what the CNR requirements are of a net, net isolation path in, uh, in the RF network. Uh, but an important thing to keep in mind is that CCAP ISO spec refers specifically to the output ports on the, uh, on the CCAP device itself. Once we start talking about DOCSIS 3.1 and a 1.2 gigahertz environment that comes along with that, um, path isolation and signal budget have to be looked at again. The, t the, the, the network that's, that's been built to handle delivering uh, 256 QAM may not, uh, nece may not necessarily have adequate isolation to deliver the higher QAM modulations. Uh, and from a signal budget standpoint, if you look, there will be a slide later that, go, that shows it in more detail. Um, the, as more and more channels become bonded to the output of the CCAP, the output level uh, is considerably lower than current CMTSs. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So as we, uh, as we mentioned, DOCSIS 3.1, this came up actually in the first presentation as well. Um, one of the main features of DOCSIS 3.1 is the higher QAM modulations that come along with it. We're now talking about 1024 and 4096 QAM. Um, and the implication of that is that it requires a higher CNR at the end device. So we need to make sure that when designing the head-end RF management network, we're not creating a negative contribution to the overall length of the CNR. There'll be a slide coming that will show that head-end RF management has a limited effect, uh, to be honest, but it's important that, that the effect that it does have is not negatively impacting on the overall CNR. And on top of that, we need to make sure that the uh, equipment within a uh, head-end RF management network is supporting up to 1.2 gigahertz. So what are the CNR requirements for the higher qual modulations? And by the way, I'm using CNR and MER uh, interchangeably here. Often people say MER, but in this type of broadband noise, CNR and MER are pretty much equivalent. Um, so in a uh, 64 QAM uh, modulation, 21 dB uh, is, is sufficient, 256 is 27, 1024 is 34. The number that we're, we're concerned with right here is 41.5. From all the presentations and white papers I've seen so far, traditional HFC technology is adequate to deliver up to 4K QAM. As soon as you start talking about AK and 16K QAM, we're into the F FTTH world. We're talking about EPON and, and fiber. So what's interesting to us from a traditional HFC standpoint is making sure that we're able to deliver 4096 QAM. And the DOCSIS 3.1 spec requires a minimum CNR of 41.5 <coughs> at, uh, at the end device. Now, some, some CMTS vendors have argued that with the LDPC forward error correction, this number doesn't actually have to be 41.5. It could be considerably lower. But in planning a network, you just should always think in terms of worst case scenarios. So let's not even factor in forward error correction and use this as our target. And if we can hit that target without forward error correction, we can let that compensate for other issues that might arise in the network. So next we have to talk about what, what, how does head-end RF management contribute to the overall CNR of an end-to-end -end link. 
And where that comes in is the isolation uh, in the head end. So the next few slides will talk about how we relate the head end uh, RF management isolation to the overall QAM CNR. Whenever a splitter faces a combiner in a network, as we saw in the first drawing, there's going to be a feedback, feedback path that's uh, created, which allows um, an unintended QAM to interfere with an intended QAM going to a transmitter. The delta, the difference between the intended QAM and the unintended QAM, that uh, presents itself as, as CNR. So in the next uh, isolation path drawing, there's a couple of assumptions here uh, that are important to keep in mind. Um, they come from our own specifications. Um, first of all is a port to port isolation, minimum of 30 dB for any passives that are in the network, and an insertion loss of combining circuits up to 1.2 gigahertz of 5 dB for, for a two-way and uh, 7 dB for a three-way. So as we look more closely at a, uh, an isolation path, we see, for example, here we have the intended QAM traveling from the first port of the, the CCAP through uh, the 7 dB loss, insertion loss of a three-way combiner plus 5 dB uh, of the two-way combiner with the broadcast signals that gets a total of X minus 12. The X, fa X is the output power of the CCAP and it cancels out in the equation anyway, so it's not relevant. Uh, what's important then is how the, uh, the unintended QAM is then attenuated through the isolation path. We see it's attenuated by the insertion loss of the, uh, of the broadcast narrowcast combiner through the port to port isolation of the broadcast uh, narrowcast combiner here. So we have a total of minus 37. Again, a port to port isolation of minus 30 here to get to minus 67. And here, another minus 5 so that we have a total attenuation of 72 dB on the unintended QAM. So you can see why that port to port isolation spec becomes so important. That port to port isolation spec is making up 60 dB of the 72 uh, isolation between the unintended QAM and the intended QAM. So that delta that we have, that 60 dB, that becomes our ISO, our net isolation of a single path. It would be nice if there were only one single path and we only had to calculate it once, but that's not the case. How, how does all of the um, interfering QAMs then sum? What is the CNR RFM? It's not the equivalent of one single path, it's multiple conflicting paths. So how does that sum? The uh, interfering QAMs at equal power levels sum on a 10 log n basis. But there's some other considerations that go into that too. First of all, the port-to-port uh, -port isolation is a guaranteed minimum of 30 dB. It's actually much better as ports get further apart, and we'll look at that again in a, in a later slide. And it also is better in different parts of the, of the frequency range. So 30 dB is the worst case. It's often much higher than that. The other thing is any cable loss. We didn't talk about cable loss or padding in that, in that simplified design. So any cable loss that exists or any padding that, that exists, that's going to also contribute to isolation. So again, there's plenty of headroom that's being created by other factors in the network that will contribute to your isolation. In practical testing, in lar many large systems with multiple conflicting paths around the world, we found that the net isolation of a system is greater than the isolation of a single path minus 10 log 8. So 10 log 8 is around 9 dB. So to give ourselves again a little bit of buffer, we say the ISO the net isolation of a single path, which is relatively easy to calculate, minus around 10 dB is your, your best estimate for the CNR of the head-end RF management. And it's much more practical to use a sort of rule of thumb number like that rather than to try and calculate the, uh, the actual impact of all those uh, conflicting paths. This uh, CNR RFM term is important. That's a term that we use. That's referring specifically to the CNR contribution of all of the head-end combining. And in the next section, we'll be looking at how that contributes to the overall CNR of the, of the system. So looking more specifically at passive isolation, what we're talking about is a port-to-port -port isolation. That means what is the attenuation of a signal coming in through here, moving its way back through the other uh, port, and then through some broadcast split over here somewhere. Uh, that 30 dB uh, minimum spec refers to a, the passive itself without any additional padding. Any padding added to that, uh, to that uh, signal will, on a one-to-one -one basis, contribute to the isolation overall. 
What's interesting is that 30, that's a 30 dB spec for a two-way. If you have an eight-way combiner or splitter, that's essentially just three two-ways in cascade. So the further that the ports get away from each other, the higher the isolation. So it's also possible when planning to keep in mind that uh, you have better than 30 dB isolation uh, depending on which ports you use. Now, that 30 dB port-to-port -port isolation is a pretty big assumption. So all of the things that we're discussing assume the ability to deliver 30 dB port-to-port -port isolation because it's on a spec sheet. But does that mean it's always going to be 30 dB? And an interesting question has come up that we've looked into, and, uh, and it's, it's true that 30 dB specified isolation doesn't always mean 30 dB port-to-port -port isolation. The port-to-port -port isolation is dependent on the return loss of the device that follows it. So in the vast majority of cases, you're going to have uh, an adequate return loss that's not going to matter. But it's, but it's important to re realize that if you have a, t a return loss of, say, 10 dB, and we use 10 dB because that's the minimum return loss for out-of-band um, uh, out signals on an edge QAM, as defined by uh, the DOCSIS RFI spec. So we use that sort of as a worst-case rule of thumb. Um, you can see the implication on a two-way. So for an eight-way with, with the three two-ways in cascade, it doesn't, it doesn't have an impact. For a four-way, it's actually a 4 dB worse performance than would be on a spec sheet. And on a two-way, it's actually 8 dB worse. So on a spec sheet, everything looks great. It's 30 dB port-to-port -port isolation. But if you have a device on the common port of a two-way, and there are no other passives in, in the way, you could theoretically have an isolation problem by not having 30 dB port-to-port -port isolation here. The good news is there's an easy fix to that, and that is, number one, um, if there's only a two-way between your narrowcast device and a transmitter, you've got tons of signal level. You've got no signal level issues. All you need is a 4 dB pad on each of these legs, and you've got it back to 30 dB. So if you're in a situation where you've only got a two-way, you'll have extra signal level. You can do it with padding. The important point is it's something to keep in mind and plan into the system from the beginning. So check the return loss of the devices that follow the, the passives. If it's an unusually low return loss, uh, make sure there's enough signal level to account for some padding. Again, if you've got a long cable run here as well, any cable loss is going to contribute to that as well. So how, how important is the RF management piece of the end-to-end -end CNR? So the two numbers that we know and that we've defined from the beginning are the uh, the CNR being of the output from the CCAP. We know that that's going to be at least 65 dB. In fact, it'll probably be 70, but let's take 65 dB as the worst case scenario as defined by the specification. And we know that you need greater than 41 and a half dB for 4096 QAM at the, uh, at the end device. The obvious huge contributing factor in between the head end RF management and the uh, cable modem is the optical link and the RF distribution. So we took a look at the performance that was uh, done in a white paper by uh, Maxwell Huang from Cisco. Uh, keep in mind, these numbers are specific to Cisco. I've seen white papers from Telesta and Eris that have similar performance. Um, but if you're using whatever vendor you're using for your optics, it would be better to run this calculation yourself just to make sure that it's in this, uh, in this range. And what he, what he was able to show is that in an M plus zero architecture, they can realize about 43.2 uh, on, the, on the CNR, and worst case of 42.3 on an M plus 7 architecture. Since all of the conversations we've been having are in the direction of N plus 0, um, we'll stick with N plus 0 for now, but the, all of these numbers can be plugged into the same calculation depending on what your, your AMP cascades look like. So what's obviously important is that the CNR of an end-to-end -end system can't be better than the worst link, right? So as I said at the very beginning, we have to make sure that the head-end RFM isn't a negative contributing factor to the end-to-end -end system. And we'll look at how changing variables in the head-end RF management uh, CNR versus the uh, HFC CNR affects the overall end-to-end -end CNR. And we'll also show that current arch HFC architecture standards easily produce the required 34 dB of CNR for, for uh, 1024 QAM and 4096 QAM as well within the reach of traditional HFC. So this is the calculation we run to, get, to calculate the net CNR of the entire system. The variables that matter here are the CNR of the CCAP, the CNR of the RFM, which we discussed already, is determined by the isolation of the head-end RFM, RF network, uh, 
and the CNR of the HFC. In this initial calculation, we've taken 65 dB for the CCAP, 43.2, which is Cisco's uh, N plus zero um, specification, and 50 dB for the uh, CNR of the head end uh, RFM, which is the, uh, the CNR from that simplified system using only port to port isolation and no cable loss or padding. When we run that through the equation, we get to a net CNR of 42.4 dB. It's above 41.5 but only just, and that doesn't allow for a lot of um, uh, variability by temperature, for example, in the amp cascade. So it needs to be better. How do we improve it? So we take that exact same equation and we start playing with different variables. This table at the top looks at what happens as we hold the CNR of the HFC constant at 43.2 and change the CNR of the head-end RFM in 5 dB increments, you'll see there is an improvement between 50 and 55. There's a slight improvement between 55 and 60, and there's virtually no effect after 60 dB. So after 60 dB uh, net isolation in the head-end, there is no real gain by going to 70, 80, 90, 100 plus. Whereas, if we keep the uh, head end CNR uh, variable constant, <coughs> excuse me, uh, at 50 dB, and, uh, and change the, uh, the impact of the, the HFC uh, CNR by increasing optical power level, for example, um, a 1 dB improvement in the, C, in the HFC CNR uh, has a much more dramatic uh, and consistent impact on the overall uh, net CNR. This is basically just a table running all the different calculations. You can see at a fixed CNR of 43.2 in the, in the HFC, increasing from 50 to 65 dB in the, the head end RF management results in a half dB improvement overall. Uh, whereas going from, say, starting from 42.9 here at a 55 dB and going and improving the um, CNR HFC by only 3 dB, results in a one-to-one -one improvement of the net CNR. So what we're trying to say with this is th it makes sense to improve from this to this in the head end, but anything beyond that, this is where the, the time and money needs to be spent because there, there's, such a more, there's so much more direct impact on, uh, on the overall CNR. Um, so just to conclude that piece on the optical link, um, again, that analysis is based on the, uh, the, the link spec from, from Cisco using minus 6 dBm. You can run that exact same calculation with the same equation uh, with any other vendor, uh, and we'll it will produce similar <coughs> results. In fact, I think Telesta just re released a white paper as well that did a similar calculation uh, with, their own, uh, with their own optics. Uh, it's practical to realize that 1 dB or 2 dB improvement in the, uh, in the link between the HFC uh, optics and the line, uh, line amplifiers. And getting to 50 to 55 uh, dB of uh, CNR in your RF management is easily achievable with passive modules and, uh, and some padding and cable loss in the middle. Some signal level considerations. Um, an important thing about uh, CCAP is how many channels are getting bonded. In the spec, it, it's possible to, to bond up to 128 channels, and that <laughs> results in an output level from the CCAP, which, cons which is considerably lower than what we'd expect from a CMTS today. Uh, so it's important to understand if there's enough signal level there to work with passives, or do we need an amplification stage in there somewhere? Here's another uh, simplified drawing. Do we need actives in the narrowcast from a signal path standpoint? This assumes, again, it depends on your, uh, on your optics vendor. So depending on the minimum input level from the optics vendor, um, the majority that we see out there requires about 20 dB on the analog and about 14 dB composite dBMV, uh, composite power for the, uh, for the qualms. If that's the case and you run it through a narrowcast combiner and even with a, a four-way splitter on the output of the CCAP, it still only requires 36 dBmV on the output, so it's fine from a signal level standpoint, but doesn't give you a lot of headroom for padding uh, or cable loss. Uh, 
Uh, that being said, you could always get rid of this four-way as well. Um, and another trick that we've seen is rather than using a narrow cast port for the CCAP, uh, because this is a three-way combiner and a two-way combiner, we've seen sort of a day two implementation with, uh, with Comcast and, uh, and Cox, where they are using the broadcast port on a narrow cast combiner to insert the CCAP signal. So they're actually winning an extra 6 dB of signal from the narrow cast, and it's quite easy for them to come up with that extra 6 dB on the broadcast just by driving the amplifier a little bit hotter. So there's a few different tricks with the way that it, gets, uh, that it gets deployed, that you can buy yourself a few extra dB of signal level if you find that signal level is, uh, is a challenge. Some other application notes, some other things that we've seen. Um, we touched on this at the beginning. Um, one question that's come up is that the broadcast channels are all far less than 1.2 gigs. They all reside in the lower frequencies now. Everything above one gig is reserved for OFDM channels. Why do I need to upgrade the broadcast splitters? Well, you don't need to upgrade all of the broadcast splitters. You only need to upgrade the last broadcast splitter in the network. So only the last splitter that, is, um, that has a, uh, an isolation relevance to the broadcast narrowcast combiner here needs to be upgraded to 1.2 gig. And the reason for that is that none of the vendors that, have, that offer 1 gig product test, uh, do quality control testing above 1 gig. So sure, the broadcast signals won't, uh, won't matter, but you could have an interfering qualm here coming through at 1.1 gig. And if that unit has not been tested for port-to-port -port isolation above 1 gig, there's absolutely no guarantee what the isolation would be. It could be that at 8 out of 10 units, it's fine, but in 2 out of 10, it's not. And you wouldn't know that until uh, testing everything and setting it up. So it makes sense, at least for the last broadcast splitter, to, um, to use a 1.2 gigahertz specified uh, product. One other thing that's come up, and I've noticed this a lot in Liberty, Liberty uh, Global properties, is there's still quite a lot of narrowcast insertion being done with directional couplers. So when looking at a directional coupler uh, insertion for the narrowcast, uh, sure, it requires uh, a little bit less signal level on the broadcast, but the way that the networks are being built now, broadcast is, is far less important than the, uh, uh, than the narrowcast signals that are, bit, that are going down through, through CCAP. So it's the trade-off now of isolation versus signal level no longer favors a directional coupler insert. In this, the isolation path in this drawing results in a delta of 50 dB, so a, a, CNR, a single pass CNR of 50 dB, minus 10 if you had all directional couplers, you've only got 40 dB uh, net isolation in your head and RF management system, which is far too low. If you switch that circuit to a two-way combiner circuit rather than a directional coupler, you automatically gain an extra 10 dB of isolation on that path just because of the way that the, uh, the attenuation uh, works. So if you, if you track that now through uh, the unintended qualm through all of the uh, attenuation of those three circuits, you immediately have a path isolation of 60 dB. You've improved the net isolation of your whole system by 10 dB just by using two ways instead of directional couplers. So this is a, a switch that I've seen happen in, I don't know, 20 operators, where over the last few years they started with directional couplers, and now as isolation becomes more of a concern, uh, they switch to a combiner circuit to combine the, uh, the narrowcast and the broadcast. Now another thing about transmitters is, depending on the vendor, it might have a broadcast input, or it might have a broadcast and a narrowcast input. So there's two ways of doing it. You can either combine the narrowcast and the broadcast um, uh, on the RF level before a single input to the transmitter, or you can use both inputs on the transmitter. One interesting thing that's come up uh, with a couple, of, uh, a couple of operators in Canada, actually, is because the, 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 the level of qualm that's necessary uh, for the transmitter is only around 14 dBmV, and the test point is minus 20 dBmV, the, they can't test the combined signal anymore. So the, they're not able to, to use the test point on the transmitter to test their combined broadcast and narrowcast services. So what they asked us to do is put a minus 12 dB test point on the end of our broadcast narrowcast combiner so that they have a place in the network where they're able to test the broadcast and narrowcast together. Here's an example of a, uh, an architecture that, um, that 
uh, Comcast has, uh, has implemented. Interestingly, you'll see that the transmit they're using needs only 7 dBmV um, for, the, for the qualms on the input, which is, uh, which is incredibly low. But again, this is going to be completely a factor of whichever optics vendor you're using. So with this architecture, it requires only 29 dBmV on the output, and there's plenty of signal level. So one recommendation I would make then is if you're concerned about signal level, check the output power of your, uh, of your, your CCAP vendor and the minimum required input levels for the analog and, uh, and quamps on the transmitter just to make sure there's enough to get through the passive uh, combining architecture. So that's it for today. Um, I'm assuming this presentation will go up online somewhere if you're interested to look at anything in more detail. I've included the references to all of the other white papers where this information comes from. So you're more than welcome to go in and, uh, and have a look. And that's it for me today. Thanks. Thank you, David. That was uh, very much appreciated. Um, a few minutes for questions. Uh, sure. Anybody's questions? Mr. John Callis at the back. Now with CCAP, it's going to be very important how far away the racks are from each other. Yeah. From losses. Would you allow a person who doesn't understand RF at all to position your racks? That's my question. You know what? It's an interesting point because that's, that came up with, uh, with Zigo, for example, in the Netherlands, um, where they had, a, they had that signal level issue. And especially at the higher frequencies, there was so much attenuation go from one rack to the other um, that they wanted to put actives in the middle. And, uh, and it was a quite a contrarian discussion in the meeting because you had former UPC guys and former Zigo guys who had sort of a different philosophy. And ultimately, the end of the question was, what makes more sense? Put a bunch of actives in the middle or move a rack? Um, so ultimately, since they're doing a lot of rebuilding to implement this anyway, the, the co-location of the rack to save attenuation is an important piece. And in fact, all of the deployments that, that we do involve the co-location of the RF management with the optics and the CMTS. So would you allow a person who doesn't understand at all RF, doesn't know what even the words RF means, would you allow him to position your racks? I, I guess I don't have a choice. <laughs> I'm not there. <laughs> exactly. But so it's, an important, it's an important consideration. Yeah. yeah. So you wouldn't really, a person who does, doesn't understand RF, you wouldn't, you wouldn't allow them to do the position because he can put one rack here and the other one 500 meters away because he doesn't understand. Uh, that's the problem we have in uh, a lot of uh, head dance and hard side these days. I, I think we another allow people to do position without understanding RF. Yeah, I think an, another g general problem in the industry is there aren't a lot of RF guys coming out of university anymore. So, so what you see is everyone's coming out of IP and, and wants to talk about EPON and fiber, but. You're running, we're running out of people who can set the RF levels, either in the head end or out in the network, that's for sure. Thank you. I was uh, out in the States recently and I heard that um, uh, some of the big US operators were actually putting the coax cable between racks, uh, across the front of the rack, rather yep. than even take it above and below. What do people here think of that practice of uh, literally cabling from one rack to the other? across the front of a rack. I, I've never seen it done here yet. Um, I think going across the front of the rack is a little bit extreme. I think you can always afford to go under or, or above. Um, but the idea of co-locating all of that stuff so that the cable runs are a couple of meters. The, the other thing that happens in the US um, is that a lot, of, a lot more mini cable is used on the RF management. So without getting too much into ATX specific products, uh, one of the RF management product lines is based on MCX connectors and mini cable. And the attenuation on mini cable is about 3 dB higher across a, a 30, 30 meter length at one gig. So for density reasons, they're using this high density combining platform with all MCX connectors and mini cable. And that's what's required. The extra attenuation on that cable is required those cable runs to be as short as possible. And in some cases, when, they're, when every half dB counts, that extra two meters or extra three meters actually, uh, actually matters. The difference here is the uptake on, the, uh, on the, the mini cable at the RF management is considerably less. There's a lot more regular RG59 out there and the losses inside.